discussion with the Aspire Institute at BU Wheelock. We are here to talk about what is on so many people's minds, which is the reopening process uh, in our school districts. Many of us have spent the summer working on this and thinking about how it is going to impact the rest of the academic year. Many of you know me as well as um, the director of the Aspire Institute, where we work directly with schools, primarily in the K through 12 space, but throughout the spectrum. My name is Kenan McKenzie, and I'm happy to welcome our other guests here. I will have them introduce themselves. Uh, we are pleased that they're from various sectors, and I'm hoping that you'll find some insight today, uh, as well as to appreciate how we're all in this together. So first, I will start with our teacher, Shante Alves. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shante Alves, and I'm a pre-K inclusion teacher at, at Young Achievers in Boston Public Schools. Next, I would like to have Dr. Grande introduce herself. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I am Dr. Grande, a classically trained clinician in rehab and pain management. Um, I'm currently medical director at Go Invo, a healthcare design firm focused on patients, clinicians, and caregivers. And we design digital health services and make complex concepts approachable and beautiful. And as the pandemic hit, we've created open source and free infographics with real-time updates, which are being used in local schools and pediatricians' offices. I'm also um, advisor to the Mass Medical Society Committee on Health IT, um, especially pushing through telehealth initiatives um, as the pandemic has uh, progressed. Thank you. Um, Takaro, please. Hi everyone, my name is Takeru Nagayoshi. I also go by TK, and I am a high school English and research teacher in New Bedford, Massachusetts. I'm also the 2020 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year, and I'm excited to be here to talk a little bit about my experiences being on the re-entry committee at both the district and state level. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this rainy afternoon and um, taking the time, because it's time well spent. Um, I am the curriculum coach in Hanover, Massachusetts on the South Shore, and I've also had an opportunity to work with the Department of Education, their advisory cabinet, and uh, the Mass Teachers Association as a member of their board of directors, and a little bit with other nonprofits in the area. So it's been a range of experiences, but I'm happy to be spending the time to speak with you. Thank you. And Lorinda. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Lorinda Visnick. My husband and I are both proud BU alums. Uh, uh, we've lived in Beverly for the better part of 30 years. We have four children who have all gone through the Beverly Public Schools, and I now serve on the Beverly School Committee. So um, I'm honored to share the space with some incredible uh, other panelists, and I just want to say that I'm here representing my own opinion and my own thought processes, not those of our committee. Thank you all so much. I'm really, really excited to hear about so much of this. Um, and I like the fact that we're all in the same virtual room. Um, so I'm hoping that we will be able to ping pong on each other, but I'm also going to be paying attention to the chat to see what it is those who are attending um, want us to think about or if they have feedback. Um, so please feel free to use your, your Q&A um, module there if you're an attendee to send us your thoughts, feedback, and questions. First, I would like everybody to consider the question of, from your unique perspective, you know, what was your role in providing input in the school reopening process if you feel like you've had a role? And I'll start with Shante. Sure. Um, so I, with my school's reopening process specifically, I was on the collective bargaining committee for reopening schools. Um, I was also on the um, education task force for early childhood when it came to reopening schools, um, as well as being a union um, member. And I was also a summer organizer with my union. So I was involved in a lot of the conversations this summer. However, the plan that is currently out does not reflect the, all of the conversations that were had. And so um, throughout this summer, you know, I, I gave a lot of time and effort to the, the committees and task forces that I was on. Um, and this is just my personal experience um, and just how I perceived everything. Um, but um, I would say that I was able to speak a lot with my union, but my district 
there was virtually no um, opportunity for me to speak with them. So we did give proposals and we did meet weekly. We're still meeting. We have a meeting very shortly, um, but it does not reflect that in the current proposal that is being put forth by the district. Thank you. It sounds like you had an incredibly busy summer too. Um, we will certainly, I want to circle back a little bit to find out what what does that actually mean if you're doing this community organizing? Um, and who were you talking to? Like, what, what does that process look like? So I'll definitely want to circle back to that. Um, but with that, I want to move on and ask the same question as well. Um, so I know that, Megan, your, your role is, is a bit different than everybody else's who's an, as an educator. So can you tell us what that looked like? Um, yes, yeah, so I, you know, I, um, Kind of, it's twofold. I'm a member of the Mass Medical Society um, and I'm on the committee on health IT and we regularly have um, weekly meetings with the Department of Public Health to establish policies and guidelines that will um, help um, not just school reopening, but in general health and well being during the time of COVID um, in Massachusetts. Um, so we advise on things like um, you know, what's, what are the best processes, um, what um, will be um, effective in terms of um, telehealth regulations, because, um, you know, uh, aside from COVID, there's always uh, other, you know, the cold and uh, other things that um, children and adults face on a um, daily basis, uh, if you take COVID out of the picture. So um, both, within and outside of the COVID realm, um, kind of figuring out how to do this remotely, which is really challenging for certain conditions. And so did you have interactions with the state education agencies directly or was it through public health? It was definitely through the public health department. So we were kind of uh, teaming up with the board of registration and the medical society and then the DPH was the sort of the conduit to communicating with the education department. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Awesome, thank you. Um, TK, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what the process was for you in terms of providing input uh, with your school or your district's reopening process. Yeah, thank you. So again, I was on the reentry committee at both our state and district level. And in both of these committees, we were asked to share concerns, solutions from our unique perspectives as educators, uh, there are also a lot of community members, public health officials, and other stakeholders. Um, for both groups, they would usually present us with a hypothetical guideline that we had to react to. Um, they would break us into subcommittees and we'd brainstorm pitfalls and concerns, uh, or they just update us on the evolving situation by having us listen to either the commissioner or public health experts. Um, I will say I was one of the few teachers in both the state and district committee. And so uh, a typical session oftentimes looked like um, you know, for instance, I was in the teaching and learning subcommittees for both of them, uh, and we would gather together with some other educators and uh, talk about key takeaways um, and react to some issues that we might perceive in a certain kind of school model. And after 30 minutes of debriefing uh, together as a small group, then we would share out our findings in a larger group. And it was the first time that I've worked alongside so many different types of education stakeholders, and I was really reminded of not just the complexity of our school systems, but how challenging affecting good and successful collective action is. Um, and if I can, uh, there are two things that I thought could have been better in this process. And the first thing was really making sure that there are more teachers and student representations. Uh, there were very few. Uh, and in no way I alone could have represented the unique concerns of all educators in the state. And I oftentimes found myself in groups uh, representing the academic challenges of every single student uh, even though my perspective is so limited to working at an urban high school setting in southern Massachusetts. And I think that there are better ways that we can organize and leverage teacher leadership on Moss, like having an educator task force that's specifically divided along school type grade or content. And I think the same can be said for students as well. Um, a second th thought, uh, a theme or takeaway, if you will, that I had is um, I think it's important that in doing this kind of work and thinking about what reentry might look like, it's so important that uh, our leaders take a stance. Uh, and I really think that good leadership uh, has a vision uh, and it has a set of core values. 
And those are important because in times of crises, like the pandemic, we oftentimes don't have a single answer, right? And so uh, having that vision really helps us guide us through. And, and managerial type of leadership uh, styles oftentimes uh, have a lot of difficulty. And I feel as though the larger the organizing group is, be it your district or the Department of Education, um, the more stakeholders that there are. And I felt that when I was in these spaces, um, there was a greater emphasis on building a semblance of a consensus rather than operating through a well-articulated vision. And so even though everyone there was super thoughtful, um, I feel as though that is why the guidelines that came out, and again, this is my own personal opinion, um, were a bit vague and uh, placed a lot of the onus on school leaders in their local context to make the decision. And if there were more clear visions and values guiding our decision, like safety above all, or let's center our most vulnerable populations first, then I think uh, school leaders wouldn't have been put in the position to make teachers come back, return, uh, and return to their schools physically uh, just to teach remotely, which is the situation that I'm in right now. Um, but that's just my soapbox. Uh, I would say on a final note and more in a hopeful tone, I was really inspired by just the number of passionate educators uh, who were thoughtful and engaged in this process. And I'm constantly amazed at the leadership in our state. And I'm really honored to be part of you know, the education community in Massachusetts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely, I, I can see that we're going to come back to that question too of um, with the continuous feedback and how that's going to happen and maybe change because of the conversations we're having and others may be having. Um, and Jean, I would be curious to hear about it from, you know, sort of a district wide lens. How did this, how did this land for you? I think you're uh, muted there. There you go. <laughs> um, as I'm listening there, I'm thinking about the amount of dialogue that has happened everywhere I go and the venues for people to have dialogue. So my family's annual tradition is we always go and have a week at the Jersey Shore. So it's, it's, it was interesting because no matter where you went, everyone had the same discussion. What's school going to look like in the fall? What's it going to be like for people? So as you walk up and down, it's all anyone was thinking about all summer long. And I think about like where, it doesn't matter what role you had, you had some sort of connection to schools somewhere. And so everyone was thinking about that. In my own district, we had so many committees working on things. We had committees with the association working on their uh, proposals for collective bargaining. We had uh, committees of parents and teachers and administrators for the district working on the guidance that was coming out of DESE that was meeting once a week. All our building administrators were having open Zoom calls for the staff uh, one or two times a week. The association was having the same. The district was then having third meetings for that. The state MTA was having meetings for people. And then on Facebook, there were so many of these other private chat groups within Facebook that were like, I like was part of like five different Facebook chat groups in all these places where the discourse was happening. And I think to sort of echo a little bit what TK is saying, like the lack of a central vision or uh, for people to grab hold of meant that there was just so much discussion in so many places with very little guidance about where any of that talk was going to. And when I was in high school, I had a, a teacher who had a sign on the board that said, after everything is said and done, more will be said than done. And I feel like that reflects a little bit of how we're uh, this going into this year because of the shifting tides of uh, what day to day we get for guidance and, and everyone having, uh, like, this, like you're saying, the stakeholder opinion, everyone's lens for this going into it is so very different and everyone's needs are so different that uh, it'll be interesting to see where it all moves. Because whatever we decide in the next couple of weeks, I don't think it will be true two weeks after that. So it's been, everyone has got to be flexible and be creative. And it's been great. I think the, the takeaway in terms of the positive is the engagement that people have for this issue and the, just the level of authentic discourse people are having with one another about their, what their true needs are and what really matters. So we'll see. Wow, I hadn't even thought about the social media component of it, so I can only imagine. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sensing this theme too of, you know, how, what is our North Star about how to make these decisions? Because there's lots of feedback and lots of discussions happening all around the same topics. Um, and Lorenda, you're gonna also hopefully shed some light on what this means for school committees trying to make these really hard decisions. Like, what did that look like? Yeah, I, I think that I, I will echo what the two educators just said. I certainly would have appreciated a little more um, 
guidance, right? I think this is the epitome of um, local decisions. And I think to some extent, I try to frame that as being honored. Um, local control is, is often a good thing, but it's hard, it's very difficult to not seem, to not feel like everybody else just kicked the can down the road. Oh, I don't have to make the decision. I'll let the local school boards make the decision. And with all due respect, um, you know, I'm not an HVAC engineer for a living. I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, nor do I have people on my staff. <laughs> you know, I have, I have children in my house. That's what I have. So, um, so that is, I think that has been the most difficult part. And so, and then we're, a, we in Beverly are a seven member board. And what I would say to you is we have seven North Stars and each of us um, then building consensus as TK said, um, you know, things get done, especially in, in government, things get done via compromise and everybody has to give a little. And so, you know, there are people who don't think we should return any children to school. And there are people who think we should return every child to school on day one. And then there are people in between. And so um, the process from a school committee point of view has been that, you know, the state has mandated that districts produce three plans, um, a plan for if you go back in person, a plan for if you stay entirely remote, and then a hybrid plan and that the feasibility studies be done. And there's been a certain amount of guidance in terms of like that level, but in terms of saying, um, most recently the governor came out and said, here's our color coded map. And if you're green or white, then we want, we think you should go back to school. Unfortunately, that guidance didn't come out until after the deadline that was um, laid down for when your school system had to vote and say what you were gonna do. So um, that also has been very maddening, um, to be brutally honest with you, because that, that guidance, that particular North Star would have helped, I think would have helped our committee a lot. Um, and we, like Jean said, there were just a lot of task, force, task forces formed, one for each uh, kind of level of our school, elementary, middle, high school. And each of those task forces had people from the community, teachers, educators, um, administrators and a school committee member. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, probably the Board of Health. Um, so just a ton of communication and a ton of sharing of information. And once all those things were going together, then we started having our meetings as a school committee and asking questions. And any given meeting is taking a really long time. There's a lot of questions. And then we finally voted. And, and again, we had the deadline that was given to us by the state. So that's the role we got to play. We were blessed. Uh, we we're, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. And I will say that one of the things we did as a school district, I think that was very helpful, is that our school committee members were allowed to go tour each of the levels, elementary, middle school, high school. And in each of those buildings, they had a room set up with six foot distancing, the desks six feet apart, three feet apart and then uh, a compromise of four and a half feet apart. And to get to those buildings to do that tour, we took the bus and we rode the bus only three feet apart and then six feet apart to see ourselves how few students can fit on a bus when they're six feet apart. And, and you know, then to think about how are we going to manage that? How many students do I have that I have to transport? And to get all the students to school approximately the same time uh, if there's if there's only 12 students on a bus because they're seated, they're spread out six feet apart. So it's it's all those kinds of things. And it at the end of the day, a lot of it unfortunately comes down to money. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't think that that's uh, um, been a huge topic in a lot of conversations, but I know that there has been, a, you know, it's like rumblings around um, what would it cost to reopen? But I think in many of the conversations I was in, it was sort of like, this is what's safe. This is what's logistically possible. But I've heard other things around um, safety concerns and finance that hasn't come up much. So I'm glad that you made that point. Um, we had a question in the chat around some of those things. And one of the questions was around, you know, basically air systems in schools. And I have heard a little bit about facilities and funding around making schools safer. Um, do you do you or Megan want to say anything about that? Were there concerns about the physical environment that 
came into play that had any role in how we were going to do this reopening by whatever district you were supporting? Uh, Megan, tell us a little bit about the, the facilities concerns, if any. Did you all address any of those things in your conversations? Um, yeah, so I think um, sort of big picture is um, there's a lot of controversy between, you know, bleach or hydrochloroquine or not, but there are things that pretty much um, majority of clinicians agree on. Physical distancing is important. Masks especially when both parties wear them, it's much more effective. Um, at, at minimum masks and hand washing 20 seconds with soap and water is best, but when not available, 70% or greater alcohol hand sanitizer. Yes, and there's also concern with ventilation, two places, school buses um, and also within schools and I think the concern is, especially in a state like Massachusetts, we have brutal winters, although last winter doesn't count. Um, we have brutal winters and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better because we're going to be in enclosed spaces um, during the winter time. It's flu season, so we're going to be seeing spikes in that along with COVID, which is going to really tax um, not just the healthcare system, but our systems in general. Um, and so, you know, our, there, but there, there's a lot of debate, you know, um, how do we, how do we measure um, ventilation? How do we measure adequate versus inadequate? Um, are we able to keep windows open? I mean, uh, it's definitely um, clear that, um, you know, it's not, um, it's not that you can't get COVID outdoors, but it's not as concentrated as in enclosed spaces, the closer you are to someone. Um, and especially the concern is um, adults um, are more likely to spread it wider than children. Um, so um, can we, uh, rather than the other way around. Um, so thinking about all of these things is going to be extremely important. And um, I think the, con the issue is there is no consensus at the moment. And we are learning, we never expected a pandemic and we're, we're iterating and learning as we go. And we are still getting data in from studies and um, uh, other um, you know, resources um, not so not just within the healthcare space, but outside of the healthcare space in terms of best practices. Mm -hmm. So, if someone were to, I don't know, you know, like allergy season, you have these air purifiers in your home. I mean, does that sound like a good investment? Or are we talking about, you know, essentially that's too low level to address some of these needs uh, for some of the districts where I do know there's there are some local options where you can choose to be in person. And I'm wondering whether there's been any, any debate on sort of the, you know, sort of low hanging fruit store version air purifiers or air circulators? Um, as far as I'm, I'm aware, um, there has been no uh, randomized controlled study to date with mm -hmm. respect to COVID um, mm -hmm. that shows that it's better or worse. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, adequate ventilation would be definitely if you can open windows, that's really is, um, and I think um, Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci addressed this, you know, that's, that would be the best strategy. But again, in Massachusetts, it's not gonna be possible in deep winter when mm -hmm. you have, um, you know, temperatures in the teens. Um, so how do we, how do we, um, you know, account for that? And do you kind of, um, you know, see, are we, do we have a mild winter like last year and can you keep the windows? The other thing is there's a lot of times where the heat is turned up so high that I see windows open in certain facilities anyways. So that's, that's a possibility, you know, as well. Right. So I would say, and I apologize for that phone call. Um, I would say that the age of your buildings has a lot to do with it. And, um, but, but in terms of like our buses, we, we said we are going to run our buses with the windows open all winter long. Oh. So that's how we're handling the transportation piece. Um, and then within 
our community, we have buildings that are basically um, kind of clustered in ages and we have a brand new beautiful middle school and its air quality is fantastic. It's brand new. Um, and uh, then our high school is approximately seven to 10 years old. And then all our elementary schools are many, many, many years older than that. And so from a, how, how do you test the air quality? How do you try to continue to um, have adequate is, is the word the doctor used. Um, that is a big, that has been a big part of our conversations. Um, to try to ensure that we have good enough air quality that our staff would be comfortable going back into the buildings and um, as well as the children. So um, there's, there's a, a, a balance there that needs to be struck because as much as any given parent wants uh, the school system to take their child back, as much as our economy needs us to do that, which that's a whole nother thing, how much the schools are relied upon to do things uh, besides just schooling, um, regardless of all those other factors, how do we how do we try to ensure that the air quality is as good as possible, especially in a, a building that's you know 40 or 50 years old, or, or perhaps even older than that? And there there have been some. Um, I relied heavily on a, not to throw BU under the bus, but I, I relied heavily on a, a very extensive report from the Harvard School of Public Health that talked about um, a series of things that you could do. And if you if you don't have an air filter system that can take a MERV 13, then what can you do, right? And, and the next step down and the next step down and the next step down. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, to some extent you have to go with what's, what's the, how good can it get? This is as good mm -hmm. as it can get. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, it's very complicated. Um, I know that based on what you all do, you probably were looking at very different variables. And then I, I suppose for school committee, you were trying to make sense of a lot of variables for all types of people. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more um, as it relates to grade level, um, Shantae and TK, like what, what are the variables you're thinking about, um, you know, Shantae, as you're organizing for your union, right? Like what are the things that, you know, we, maybe it looks like school committee where you're looking at air quality, personal safety, learning, but I'd love for you two to take turns talking to us about what are the unique variables that you had to also consider um, as a teacher and as an educator from your grade level perspective. Sure. Um, so specifically, I was on the collective bargaining committee, but then I was also on the academics task force for early childhood. And when we're talking about early childhood, especially when you're talking about the li very little, like three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, you're thinking about how realistic is this experience going to be? And so what, not barriers, but what guidelines and restrictions do we need to have in the classroom to ensure that social distancing actually takes place? And so we're thinking about different seating. Like right now, I, I was in a, a PD earlier today where my principal showed us that we're no longer going to no longer going to have like circle tables or rectangle tables each kindergartner is going to have their own space and so that is like foreign to us because we're all about learning together integration playing together social skills oral language having close conversations playing together learning how to resolve conflict so now we have to say okay how can we make this work what supplies do we need we need each student to have um, their own school set of supplies they need to have their own home set of supplies but then that gets into like resources do we have the resources to provide that and we, we teachers are being creative in how we're going to provide that because we know the engagement for families and students is that much greater attendance is that much greater if they have their own resources at home and so we're thinking about that we're also thinking about um teachers we were researching different uh seating options on amazon before the district told us what it would be and so we saw you know seating options where there was like a, a board connected to like a, a a little like what is it called a tv like stand or when you're eating tv dinner on the couch one of those little trays a table tray there you go um so like a board connected to a table tray and could they sit on the floor with that and then we're thinking about nap time because we, we still want to have nap. You know, this is a, a big transition, an extended day for them, especially at my school, we're a pilot school, an extended learning time school. So that means they're there from 8, 10 in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's a long day for a little. 
Um, and so we're thinking about how can we keep it as consistent as to what it would be, what school would be, but also being mindful of the social distancing. I mean, we're thinking about, you know, snack time. How does that work? Like, um, even with the hybrid model, how can we make sure that the students that are on Zoom are still in interacting with the students that are in the classroom, um, projecting our Zoom screen so that the students on Zoom are able to be seen widely. Thankfully, my classroom has a big monitor and so we can airtain my computer screen to that screen, but we're trying to be creative in the ways of how we can still provide engagement and interaction for both groups. Um, but then also lunchtime, like how, <laughs> I sometimes go to lunch with my kids and I'm sitting there eating their, their hands are everywhere. They're all over Miss Al's. What are you eating? Like, you know, so it's just, how am I going to say like, stay where you are. You can't come closer. You can't like a big value in kindergarten is sharing and being supportive. And so support looks different now. So you cannot support another student. You cannot support a friend by picking something up for them or passing them a paper. Like it's it's a very rigid structure now that we had to think about. And, and again, I think for us, we were like, well, at least we can provide them with their own set of supplies, their own blocks, their own vehicles, their own counting chips that they can still, which is what we did with remote learning, but they can still play together, but not together. So that was, those were a lot of the things that we were thinking about. I, I feel like my, oh. Thank you, that was, that's a lot. That's a lot to think about. TK, high school, what, what is this? There, I know there are lots of things going on with high school we don't even <laughs> imagine. Tell us I, more about my, that. my head was just spinning listening to all of the different variables um, that Shante mentioned. And I think it's a good encapsulation of um, it's not just one model that we're coming up with these variables for. It's the hybrid. It's the remote. It's the case that uh, we phase in. And, and there's so many different things. Um, everything that uh, Shantae mentioned with regards to resources, absolutely. But also things like uh, teacher burnout, uh, tech access, uh, mental health and social emotional concerns for our kids, right? Uh, everything uh, we try to think about, and, and, and I thought it was incredibly um, it's just there's so many rabbit holes that you can go under even from just my purview as an English teacher I think a lot about uh, how am I going to get books to students because if I get them uh, I can't get the uh, do I do I create a pickup system where I give them physical books but then uh, if I get them PDF copies uh, there are definitely going to be some students who can access it through PDF does it even make sense uh, to assign a 400 page book uh, in a time like this when there are those implications around equity access and internet access right um, and so uh, very mind-numbingly overwhelming. Um, Lorinda mentioned a little bit about just like transportation issues. And I remember being in one of these sessions, it was just focused on transportation uh, and busing and, and from the logistics of the routes to the cleaning protocol, to what it means to communicate these things to the uh, family members, to what it means to compensate the drivers. Uh, there are so many things that are just consistently layered. And so to our system leaders uh, who are listening right now, I don't envy you. Uh, and we know that it's a really unsung job to think about all these different aspects. So I really thank you. Um, that said, I do want to go back to my point on, you know, values centric leadership and vision. And I'm not really sure if this is a variable per se, but I do wish that there was a, a greater focus on equity um, as the front and center uh, variable in these processes. And uh, Lorinda, you also mentioned how oftentimes in policy spaces, it really comes down to funding and money, but you know, even in a place like New Bedford Public Schools, right, uh, I, I want to make the claim that especially one size that fits all policies tend not to uh, benefit us uh, because the reality is, is that not all of our schools are created equally, right? And a simple policy suggestion like how all teachers need to go back to their schools uh, to do remote learning in the buildings while good in intent, because it's about making sure that we're all coming together as a community, that we're having a sense of normalcy, that there's a sense of accountability, it does impact schools differently. Um, my school has over 200 educators, and so there is a big health concern related uh, to having all of our educators come back into this building. Um, I also work at an urban school where there are a lot of uh, English language learners and uh, people of color who live in multi-generational households uh, in relatively densely populated neighborhoods. And so our transmission rates are higher than the state average itself. And so I, I think there are just difficulties around um, asking our schools to do things 
um, because all school systems are different. Uh, and so um, that is just something that I wanted to put out there as well. I hear you about the, of course, variation in community um, makeup and demographics and impact for sure. I'm wondering, um, Jean, as you're working with teachers um, district wide, are you hearing some of these concerns reflected and how are you in your capacity having to think about, you know, early childhood all the way through the types of things we think about, like TK mentioned in another conversation about the impact on AP exams and AP classes and that's another unique space. Um, but again, all these things are, are probably coming to you from teachers who are um, being coached and wondering how they're gonna pull this off. I have two things to say about this. So <laughs> I'm actually gonna jump back to learning space first and then come back to your original question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, and just because I haven't had a chance to share a screen, yet, I'm gonna share my screen a little bit too. Um, so I'm gonna do that with y'all. And make this a little bit bigger for everyone to see. Um, so I'm thinking about like our space and how do we get outside? And I'm thinking about the ideas that we need to really lean into our moment and take advantage of whatever you've got. Like on Apollo 13, they had to maximize everything they had available to them. And so I started thinking about like, how do we start moving more into our environment? And everyone's schools set up in different places, but how do we start looking at those as advantages to our situation? If we wanna be outside, how do we provide more learning outside? And so the Intrepid Academy at Hale is one organization that really leaned into the idea of outdoor learning and being an outdoor space for education. So that's just one model that's close to us that uh, would be a resource. But I think if we look more globally, at societies and countries where they're looking at well, how do they teach outdoors. At Hale Academy, they say there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. And so like you're thinking about like all of these different variables that happen to people, how can we start thinking about this? So I'm sort of fortunate that my middle school is stationed right across the street from the Hanover Greenway, this whole Colby Phillips trails piece. That's a whole set of learning up potential that could happen out there. And between us and the next building is vernal pools all set up in between it. And this just happens to be where our school is centered, but every school has something that's unique and special that they're centered around that could get people outside when it's safe to be able to do that work and really, again, lean into the moment and be creative about the solutions about where we, where we place people and that we're not just stuck within the four walls of a building. We live in a space that's bigger than that. In addition to thinking about that, I also think about this next um, sort of piece of it. And it's really this, this is an idea that I have that I'm just putting out there. People talking about their learning pods. There's a lot of people that need space to put people, but thinking more broadly in terms of community engagement, where can they go? Like, so where are there sports and recreational facilities around that aren't being able to use because they're not having those indoor sports? Where can we then house maybe half of our cohort groups? Churches and civic organizations, like the veterans of foreign wars are not necessarily doing a program at seven in the morning, but that might be a great place to stick a small group of maybe 12 kindergartners, or even commercial properties where those large rooms. Like all these things uh, have unique problems that come with them, but I also think it's a creative and innovative way of thinking outside of just the school grounds and just the four walls of our classrooms to think what other spaces could we be using where we just space is a premium and we need as much of it as we can find. So that's just one of my, uh, <laughs> my to do's. But I was also thinking your, your original question about how we're we preparing staff for all of these variables. And I think leaning into that is thinking about what's our PD look like for going back to school. We have these 10 days that are sort of assigned to us for professional development at the beginning of the year and think about how we're gonna develop that. And so I have one more thing to share with you with that. And it is this uh, piece here. So you can see this little targeted PD thing. I need to get to the screen to go full view. There we go. So really start thinking about our staff in different groups. There's some stuff that everyone needs information for. Like all of our staff needs information about safety, community, health, assessment, communication. Everyone kind of needs that. But then starting to think about like the people that I work with, does everyone need the same stuff? I mean, everyone comes to the table with various gifts and talents. So started maybe thinking of our staff as innovators, implementers, and motivators. Those people that live to create new stuff. They want to research it. They're going to make that next new document. Those are innovators who are thinking really about all that. Then we, I work with other people who are incredible implementers. They are the people who are like gonna scaffold all that instruction and put it in place in a way that like puts, all the, puts me to shame at least. 
And then we got those other people for whom there's other challenges around technology and things like that, but they're great motivators. They can let you know what you've turned in, what you haven't turned in, what else you need to be more effective in class. So I think targeting our PD during those 10 days and thinking about that in a more strategic way is another way of sort of, as we consider variables and thinking about what our staff needs to be more effective. Um, considering the different models we're looking at, we can't look at people as if they're all the same. All of our teachers have come with the same gifts and talents, but maybe preparing their PD and meeting them with what they need that's gonna make our school community a more rich place might be a better lift when I think about those 10 days and start thinking about those places. Sorry. Well, thank you for that. That was a geographic. <laughs> that was really, really helpful. I'm wondering, um, does everybody have the same entry point of professional development for two weeks or is that now? So just tell me a little bit about what your specific district is doing if the decision has been made and shared and you feel comfortable saying like, let's say for the next month, this is what the plan is. Uh, um, so TK, what, is, what does that look like for you? Are you similarly having that um, period of training for several weeks? Yes, uh, so mine is similar to Jean, but I am aware that other teachers don't uh, have it a little bit differently. I think uh, the implementation side might look a little bit different. So uh, in my case, uh, while we do have two weeks um, until our students actually come and we have a specific cohort of kids coming back, um, we are still required to be physically in school during that time. Uh, whereas I know that in other districts, um, they have pushed back against that idea. And so during that period where educators are sort of figuring out what the school system um, is going to look like, they can do so remotely. And so um, I'm, I'm curious about what Shantae's situation looks like, so I'm going to throw it over to her. Yeah. Well, thanks, CK. Um, so it's definitely different in Boston. So Boston is currently, we have September 8th to the 11th is when all teachers, paraprofessionals, um, CFCs, and those are community field coordinators, um, sorry, what, they all report to their buildings. Um, originally, that was the plan. And then our union said, no, 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 like you don't need to do that. And they pushed back and we were able to have the option of whether you wanted to go in on those days or attend PD remotely. And so um, a lot of people are choosing remotely. I chose to do two days in, two days out because I'm a building rep and some people wanted to meet me and socially distance, of course, and, and ask me questions. So I said, sure, especially the new teachers, I'll be there on these two days. Um, and then right now, as of September 14th, we are supposed to then go back into the buildings, um, mandatory, everyone goes back into the buildings on those days. Um, and then we will start teaching remotely from our classrooms September um, 21st, in which Honestly, I think that for us, TK, we're, we're one of those unions that are pushing back on that. Um, but according to Commissioner Riley and, and other um, stakeholders who have, have stated their case of why that is has been decided is just so that we can start preparing our classrooms for the hybrid model and also like give students the, the classroom view of us in, in that space. Um, so that is what is happening right now. Um, though I do know that the union is still pushing back on us having to be in, in school and teaching remotely. So not just being in school the week of the 14th, but then also having to teach remotely from our classrooms. Um, I, that also is a pushback. And if I may add this in listening to especially Jean and TK, um, I think for, for me as a teacher, I think the biggest disappointment, disappointment for me in this whole process is that the teachers are the last people, if at all, to get a say in what in choice. And so um, we're giving choice to everyone else, but the people who are going to be on the front lines actually dealing with multiple groups of students and individuals and adults every day. Um, and then there's no choice. Like I feel for my teachers who have children at home, like they're wondering what's that plan look like? There's still no plan for teachers who are also parents who are choosing remote for their students or choosing hybrid for their, their children, where is the plan for that? So that along with schedules, like there's just so many things that we still don't know. Wow, that is a lot going on. I wanna, I wanna also hear from Lorinda, if you can describe what Beverly is going to do and if that, does that look at all like what Jean described? Uh, so first I wanna say that I think um, our administration and then our union both sent out surveys to the teachers. We also sent out surveys to the parents and that's part of the data that the school committee had in terms of trying to uh, determine 
if uh, you know what what models we should uh, open in, and and so I personally have been really big on this idea that um, I don't want to ever think that I'm forcing a teacher back into the classroom. Um, and so for my personal, again, from, you know, we're a, we're a body of seven, but I'm only one vote, but I can't imagine um, saying to someone, you have to return to work. And I understand that the DESE handed down their guidelines, but I'm, I'm not there. Okay, so um, that, that's me personally. And so um, that said, we also got a ton of emails from our parents and from teachers, in addition to the survey results. And I do have a decent number of teachers who have said to me, I can't, um, like you said, Shante, I, I can't teach my kindergartner how to hold the pencil correctly over a Zoom meeting, right? I can't, um, in as much as it will be different in my classroom, I won't be able to hug and I won't be able to teach them everything we all needed to learn. We learned in kindergarten, right? There's, there's a whole poster about that. Um, still having those littles in person is um, was prioritized, at least in my mind, um, from the educators that I spoke to, from our educational leadership team. Now, so so our pre-K to fours are going back. They're going back five days a week. In, they will be four and a half feet apart in their classrooms, so approximately 15 to 16 children in a classroom max. And some of our federal funds are being used to pay for extra teachers to add classrooms so that our class size can be that small. We did pass a mask policy. And then we have you know, all kinds of cleaning protocols that we put in place. And as I mentioned earlier, the bus protocols. So um, it is my understanding that every teacher who felt uh, that they didn't want to return to a classroom, they were given an option to teach in the remote learning academy. And that made me okay with voting for that because I say, all right, I'm not forcing anybody back behind a desk. They have a choice. Um, then we voted that five and six, five is a transition year for us. So um, fifth grade is in our middle school and we have an upper middle school and a lower middle school. So we put the fives and sixes together and it's a brand new school, as I mentioned, it's a beautiful school. So they're in a, we split them into two cohorts and um, any given day, um, one of the two cohorts will be in. And by doing that, they'll be at least six feet apart in their classrooms. So two days a week they're in and then three days a week they're out. And then the rest of our students, seven to 12 are remote. And I would say um, we've gotten a lot of pushback on that. And, and, and a lot of that pushback has been around the mental health and the isolation. And we're trying to have discussions. Um, Jean, I love seeing your slide because every meeting I say, where, where's the plan for how we're gonna rotate our students who are quote unquote remote onto campus so that they can meet their teachers, they can do something in an outdoor space, um, you know, socially distanced with their masks on, but to remove some amount of that isolation and build some of the bonds that we really need. And, and we recognize that they need those bonds, but we're not ready to put every child back in a classroom yet, right? We're, we're you know, that, that's what we have voted in Beverly the three different three different models in essence um, for the three different kind of age groups can i respond to that really quickly um, i i love what you said because just friday was i in a, a a task force meeting where we said um to someone who has you know some sort of pull in in the the main building we said why can't we just get the same students for all five days like why do we have to have group a and group b like like for someone like me who has, I live at home alone. I don't have any immunocompromised people living with me. I wouldn't mind going in five days a week and just have the same group of students those five days a week. And then we asked about why can't we have a remote learning academy for the teachers who are immunocompromised or who are living with, you know, family members that are immunocompromised. Why can't they get the choice to stay home and teach just the families that want to be at home as well? And so I appreciate that you gave the choice because I don't mind going back for the students that need it. However, there was no choice. You know, I don't have the choice otherwise, but I, would, I wouldn't mind tapping in for a teammate who's like, I need to stay home. Can you go in? Sure, no problem. I don't have anyone living with me that I would have to worry about every day. Wow, that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, and as the year goes on, we're going to love to hear more about how this is going. I'm guessing that, fingers crossed, that there are ways that 
surveys and other kinds of data will be collected to see how it's going for students and um, teachers in this space. And I would hope parents as well would be looped into that. Um, I don't wanna wrap up without uh, asking Dr. Cronde to share with us a little bit of the information that was provided for just the safety and wellness guidelines, because I know that's a huge concern if you're hybrid or in person. And I think there was something there for parents perhaps too. So I don't know if you wanna um, share that slide with us and have us just take an info, you know, to look at the infographic to see what was shared with families and schools. Um, so I think um, quickly, um, first of all, I want to say um, what everyone brought up, especially TK and Shante, regarding um, paying exquisite attention to diversity, inclusion, and equity and disparities. It is so critical um, in, in all of this. And what I would really love to see it, rather than fragmentation is collaboration and cooperation. So those that, communities that are well resourced sharing with under resourced communities at a time when we need it the most. Um, that is my greatest dream during this uh, peer, during this time. Um, a couple of things um, I did want to mention. So I want to emphasize, I am not a fan of social distancing. I'd like to call it physical distancing because social and emotional well being can be enhanced through schools. Um, and particularly for um, those children that, um, you know, are underserved, live in under resourced communities, I think emotional and psychological support is critical. And often they can get that through schools if, like, a parent does not have. In, is uninsured or underinsured. I think that's really an important piece. And as Shantae mentioned, um, you know, language and interpersonal skills are developed through social interaction. So I don't think we should be socially distanced or isolated. We should be physically distancing, but we should connect socially. It, um, it is crucial for us to survive this pandemic. Um, and the other thing um, I had mentioned, masks. So um, definitely effective when both parties wear them. However, they aren't optimal for everyone, including those who have health problems that affect breathing, um, those who are interacting with people who are hard of hearing or have disabilities, and very young children. Um, so the CDC does suggest schools using masks with a see-through covering over the mouth for young students or students with disabilities. Um, for younger children, um, I think there should be some structured time where they can take their masks off and have a breather, preferably outdoors. Um, easier said than done during uh, winter months. And um, but you know, uh, even throwing on a coat and boots and getting out there for a little bit, and I think some fresh air is always good. Um, I think um, before entry to school, up to date on all immunizations. Um, I know there's a huge anti-vaxxer movement in this country, but vaccines save lives um, and more, very important right now. Um, the other thing is um, I think transport, um, ideally drop off, walk or bike, but um, not possible for everyone, but limiting capacity to about 50%. Um, and entry to school, keep sick children home, um, which can be challenging, especially um, to working parents. Um, and symptoms and temperature checks are not foolproof because children actually um, ha it may not be even symptomatic or have a fever and can still transmit um, the virus. Um, and then the other things to think about are, um, you know, um, cohorting. Um, as Shantae mentioned, you know, the same teacher seeing the same students throughout the week. Um, and definitely critical is uh, sanitizing, you know, high touch surfaces. And we did touch on ventilation, so I would will not go further into that. So those, I think, are the critical um, things to be considered 
from um, a healthcare perspective. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. Um, and this could be downloaded on GoInvo. Is that where we would get that? Abs yes, absolutely. This is all, um, uh, uh, you know, um, open source, uh, totally free, can be uh, downloaded as PDF or printed as a poster. Um, one last thing to mention, no contact sports. Mm. Right. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm still I'm starting to see the sports guidelines coming out, too. So I'm very curious to see how that's going to go. We all cannot be in a bubble uh, in Florida. So uh, and I know that, again, this is part of the social emotional um, wellness for a lot of young people. This is part of their school engagement, um, not just athleticism. Right. Um, so just so much to consider. Um, I know that we're running. Um, you know, close to the time that we need to wrap up. And I'd like to give you all an opportunity to share your closing thoughts and to know that you're always welcome to come back. I think we're going to have to keep having these conversations. Um, but if there's anything you want to say in terms of encouraging your fellow educators um, or any closing words, I would really appreciate that. And I thank you so much for giving your unique perspectives to this conversation on school reopening. Um, so certainly, you know, you don't have to, but I would say we could go in, in order uh, if you wanna share some thoughts. All right, so Shante, TK, any of you have some closing parts? Yes, I, I was waiting to see if anyone would have me first. Um, so something I especially wanna say to, to the early childhood teachers is that there are ways to make this as engaging as possible. Um, look into your district and see if they are offering any um, PDs or trainings, webinars on apps like Seesaw, uh, Flipgrid, ways where students can record videos of themselves and, and place it on a, a screen that can be seen by all families and all students. And that way you can get out a feel of who they are and get closer to them um, as many. And also uh, providing them with resources. I, I mean, I will continue to say that if you're able to, whether you have it in your classroom or you use a uh, funding site, like just please consider um, providing families with resources and students with resources if your district is not already done. All right, thank you. TK. I just wanna make a quick note on teachers and educators being amazing, uh, being on the district and also the committee and it was interesting to see how the district committee was looking at what Desi would say and Desi didn't want to say anything because they wanted to respect the local uh, districts. And there was a sort of chicken egg issue of uh, decision making that I think uh, kept uh, pushing or kicking the cow down without uh, actually making any decision making. Uh, and in that vacuum, I think educators, uh, those who are, you know, in the work uh, stepped up. And, and, I, and I think that that sort of similar drive and energy is going to happen. And, and, and rather than looking to other people to help us, I think finding our communities and, and being reminded of uh, our strength and our power and our capacity to organize ourselves and to learn from each other uh, and then make those decisions ground up rather than waiting for them to come from top down is um, something I hope would happen. Thank you. I have a couple of Q&A comments just saying what a great job everyone's doing and you all are wonderful. Um, we do have a question around how we're going to have time to cover all the things that need to be covered and I definitely want to address that in a future conversation once you all have had some experience under, under your belt um, and thinking about how to do that. So I do want to tell um, our audience member that we're going to look for some data. We're going to come back and see how it went. Um, but we're all thinking about that in terms of equity and access. How do we get children educated in the best quality circumstances. And we're gonna see how some of this unfolds throughout September and into October. Uh, Lorinda, did you have any um, last thoughts you wanna share? Or? I, I would love to uh, just give a huge shout out. It's, this is a very difficult time. And I worry that our communities are vilifying the different groups. And I would beg people to find grace and find a way to be thankful for what we have and, and be appreciative to, to our educators. Um, everybody who works in the school environment is, um, there's a special place in heaven for all of you, just regardless of what your religion is. Um, you're, you're incredible. Uh, you were incredible when we had to pivot on a dime back in the spring and, you, and you're incredible now. And so I certainly appreciate every single educator, every member of the staff and, and all of the thought process that has gone in. And I 
hope that other people, even if they're disappointed that their that their local board has voted to keep their child remote, um, that they can appreciate the, all of the incredible thought that has gone into all of those decisions, and and um, and and find a way to come together as a community versus um, feeling the anger and doing the vilify thing, because nobody nobody's winning. Nobody's winning when we go that route. Yes, Jean. If I can just piggyback on that too, my thought was in the beginning of this, one of the things I had picked up was the, I, asking, how are you doing? And that just became essential, those check-ins, uh, how are you doing? And what can I do to help you or be more supportive? And the other day we were had our prep meeting and I was like, I had a side chat with TK. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a little year and uh, he's like it's really it's our job to really check in and motivate each other and make sure that we can all stay up and I think it, to piggyback on that like really just be generous with your with your compassion and your kindness and your empathy as we move into the school year because there's not a person around who can't benefit from it so be generous with that thank you um yeah, I can't say enough about how much I appreciated the fact that we have a lot of different perspectives here, but I think the united front that I would think we're all leaving here with our North Stars, at least we want a great education for children. Like that, that seems to be a North Star. And I think all of us would embrace the idea that equity is important, um, as well as the safety and wellness of everyone involved. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Crande for joining us with that um, perspective as well. I really am, you know, hats off to our health professionals who are also scrambling to make sense of this. Um, and best wishes as you enter your classrooms uh, remotely uh, or in person um, and with making those tough decisions as, as officials as well. So I appreciate you being here today. Um, everyone stay safe. We look forward to talking with you again in the future. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.